faculty and program and program director at Montgomery County Community College in the Philadelphia region. And I'm co-lead on this project with, with Jim Duclos, who you're going to hear, hear from in just a second. So this project is a workforce development project funded by NIMBLE, the National Institute for Innovation of Manufacturing Biopharmaceuticals. So NIMBLE is a, a public-private partnership that's partly funded by NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology and the Department of Commerce. It's one of 16 manufacturing USA institutes that are in existence now. So, so this project brought together six community colleges and um, they're listed here and um, we'll, everyone will introduce themselves in just a second. But each of these community colleges, as you can see in this chart on the right, are in a region that's considered a top US biopharma cluster. And this is from genetic engineering use. In addition to that, each of these community colleges in, is in a hotspot for selling gene therapy companies. So these partners were handpicked by Jim DeClos to come together to, to develop this, this work. Um, so I introduce myself and I'm going to pass it along to Jim now and we'll just go in the order in the table here. So Jim, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you. I'm Jim DeClo and I teach biology and biomanufacturing at Solano Community College in the North San Francisco Bay. So we are in the city of Vacaville, California, which is a biomanufacturing hub. Thanks, Maggie. Russ? Yeah. Oh, oh, uh. Hi, can you hear me all? Good. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I'm Russ Reed, and I'm a co-PI of this particular project, We Bet. I'm located at Foresight, Foresight Technical Community College. I'm also a co-PI on Innovate Bio, and I'm happy to be here. I'm not sure if Izu has joined us yet. Izu, are you here? So we'll move forward with um, Dominique. Hi everyone, my name is Dominique Ngato and I'm a faculty member at Miracosta College. I teach biomanufacturing uh, in upper division as well as lower division biotechnology courses. And I'll pass it off to Barbara. Thank you. Hi, I'm Barbara Hukosa. Sorry, I'm a little sick this morning. Um, I work with Dominique at Miracosta College where I serve as a department chair and faculty in the biotechnology department. And I'm not sure if Louise is with us today. Louise uh, recently moved on from Shoreline Community College. Louise, are you here? So perhaps not. So um, we'll get started then. And I want to just go through today's agenda. It's a two-hour webinar. We've broken up into sections. And what we want to do today is to cover the outcomes and activities of this grant project. And um, Initially, these train-the-trainer sessions were meant to be in, in person, so we had planned in the original proposal to have uh, faculty come to each of our colleges and learn some of the hands-on curriculum that we were developing. But because of the pandemic, of course, that wasn't possible last summer, so we switched to this online format. Uh, but I don't think you'll be disappointed. So we're going to kick off with a, an overview of cell and gene therapy by Jim DeClo, and then we'll move on and talk about some of the labor market research that we've done, and that will be presented by Russ Reed. Um, then we'll move on to our industry involvement, how we got our industry input and what we did with that information in updating existing skill standards and um, uh, making outlines for cell and gene therapy courses. Uh, we'll then take a, a break and then we'll cover some of the lab-based curriculum we've developed over the last year. And that will be adeno-associated viral production in HEC 293 cells. And Izzo will be presenting that work. This is one of two Train the Trainer sessions that we hope to hold. The second one will be also in collaboration with Innovate Bio. And we're hoping to do that in late January. The second session will cover additional lab-based curriculum cell and gene therapy production analytics, the regulatory framework and equipment one might need in order to, to set up these programs and courses at your college. Without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Jim, who's going to give us an overview in cell and gene therapy. Jim. Thank you very much, Maggie. 
Oh, one general feature I wanted to point out, though, is that uh, this is funded by Nimble, as Maggie said, but Nimble has taken great, uh, has devoted great attention to the community colleges as a major component of the generation of workforce. And so we really have gotten recognition both by Nimble and by Biomade. Uh, whenever they're at national meetings, they will say, our university and community college partners. We are an integral part of that. And this project has been part of raising, I think the, uh, the prominence or the visibility of community colleges to the industry uh, in the training, especially in biomanufacturing. So I got into this uh, by starting with uh, traditional, what we're calling traditional biomanufacturing. And here we have a picture of a monoclonal antibody and that's mainly what they make across the street from me at Genentech Vacaville. Uh, here's my students, Lizbeth, and she sort of symbolizes this where she started with traditional biomanufacturing. She is now working in gene therapy at Biomarin. And a lot of the people that we interviewed that you'll hear about later, our subject matter experts in our listening session started with the production of monoclonal antibodies. And then they made the tradition the, the transition into making either gene therapy agents or CAR T therapies. And so this is, uh, as Sandy said, the cutting edge. Now, the way I got into it is that some of my graduates who were working across the street at Genentech uh, were hired by, uh, uh, by Juno, which became Celgene, which was acquired by Bristol Myers Squibb in, in, in Seattle. And they gave them these amazing signing bonuses. And I thought, okay, you got my attention. I think I had heard of CAR-T, but then I started to look into it and I said, this will be a major emerging part of biomanufacturing. And so then uh, the team uh, has been immersing itself for the last two years. Next slide, please, Maggie. So uh, cell and gene therapies. Now these are different, but we sort of group them together in that these are new products. They are no longer merely proteins. They are orders of magnitude more complex. Of course, a virus is more complex than a protein because it's made of multiple proteins and nucleic acids. And then a cell is the next level of complication as well, uh, where they share common features is you use viruses to transduce the cells that are used in cell therapy. Next slide, please, Meg. And I go to conferences and I like to ask the question, how many talks in will it take before someone mentions a patient? That is, remember, we get caught up with the technology, we get caught up with the science, but at the end of the day, these are therapies that are saving lives. And this is the story of Emily Whitehead, who was the first pediatric patient to receive a CAR T therapy. And it is a really engaging story where she was saved from certain death. And now she is a teenager. And every year on the anniversary of her treatment, uh, she holds up that sign of how many years cancer free. And so this is, at the end, why we are doing this uh, to save children. The current CAR-T therapies are against leukemia and leukemias are mainly treating children. And so uh, keep the patient in mind. These therapies help patients. Next slide, please. And also with gene therapy, gene therapy is, uh, again, often children, children that are faded through no fault of their own, but by inheriting of faulty alleles uh, from their parents. They're, they're fated to a really degenerative disease, a relentless disease, a cruel disease. And at the end of the day, they will be spared that. This will alleviate human suffering. Uh, and our students can be part of the manufacture uh, of these life-saving elements. We really are, with exaggeration, add stem cells to this with, without exaggeration we can say the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the disabled will walk, and children will be uh, spared suffering uh, because 
of this field and because of the work that our students are going to put in. Next slide, please. Now, in the past, we talked a little bit about gene therapy and cell therapy uh, in a previous biomanufacturing um, session. Uh, but uh, what I'd like to do is review that and go in the sense of time, uh, go through sort of the, the take home lessons, the take home lessons. So for gene therapy, you really are talking about adeno associated virus mainly. That is the main uh, of all of these viral vectors. That is the one that is emerging as the key viral vector that's being produced by most companies. Now, uh, for cell therapy, you can use a lot of different vi uh, viruses to transduce your cell therapy products. But what is emerging is lentivirus. So lentivirus production as the virus uh, that will transduce the cells. Next slide, please. So in vivo, in vitro, and ex vivo. So you probably are teaching your students in vivo and in vitro. And here is adeno-associated virus being injected directly into the patient. That is an in vivo treatment, not an in vivo experiment, but an in vivo therapy. Uh, but ex vivo, with ex vivo, you take the cells out of the patient and manipulate them outside of the patient, sort of in an in vitro way, but then put them back into the patient. Next slide, please. So host cells for the production of the viral vectors. And again, you produce different viruses for these different, different applications. Adeno-associated virus for gene therapies and lentivirus for cell therapies. The two that have emerged are human embryonic kidney cell 293, HEC 293 cells, and insect cell lines for the production of adeno-associated virus. So uh, lentivirus and adeno-associated virus are both produced in HEC-293. And these are the cells that you would likely be teaching your students to cultivate uh, if your students are going to be going into uh, this field, if they're going to be hired by a cell and gene therapy company. Next slide, please. So uh, my, in real estate, it's location, location, location. Uh, for your students, it's aseptic technique, aseptic technique, aseptic technique. So your students should become experts in manipulation of animal cells. Uh, perhaps HEC-293, uh, maybe 3T3 cells or CHO cells, uh, whatever cell line you, you choose. And sometimes insect cells are just easier to grow. You can grow them in suspension. They grow quickly, relatively quickly for an animal cell. They have a high cell density. Uh, you can do them in a shaker flask. Uh, you incubate them at 27 degrees. Uh, but these are the cells that, that your students should be able to grow cells both in suspension culture uh, and uh, as adherent cells. Next slide, please. Everything in these fields is single use. And so the bioreactors are all either plastic bags that are rocking or they are frames that are lined with a plastic bag uh, and they will be used to grow the cells, to produce the viruses, and then thrown away. Single use, disposable, everything along the line. Downstream will be disposable. Everything will be disposable. Next slide, please. And when you make these processes bigger, the unit operations get bigger, typically it's a scale out rather than a scale up. In traditional biomanufacturing, you start a cell in a small, maybe shaker flask or uh, in a spinner flask and then move to a bioreactor the cells divide, you dilute them in the next size bioreactor, you transfer them to a larger bioreactor, transfer them to a larger bioreactor, that is a scale up. In this case, uh, often you will add another operation 
another operation, another operation, and that is scale out. Next slide, please. Remember that there is a risk here. Uh, when I talk to students about traditional biomanufacturing, uh, you gown up to protect your process. You gown up to protect your cells from you. Uh, in this case, when you're working with human tissue, uh, there is a finite risk and there will be universal precautions. Uh, you're working with viruses. These are viruses that are engineered to infect humans. And so it, it is different in that way as well. Now, uh, adenal associated virus is biosafety level one. Insect cells are biosafety level one. And so your, the laboratory that you're in now uh, is fine, is suitable. If you would like to stick to producing adeno associated virus in insect cells, and as Maggie's going to explain, we are developing protocols for you to do that. But if you move to human cells like HEC-293, uh, those will require biosafety level two. You will have to convert your lab to a biosafety level two laboratory. And really that means signage. It means additional restrictions of who can go in there. It means being stricter on autoclaving everything that goes, that comes out of there. And so there are procedures that aren't insurmountable, but it, but it does add that next layer of complication if you would like to uh, work with human cells. Next slide, please. Here is what a real manufacturing center looks like. This is the University of Pennsylvania, which has been at the core of cell therapies for a long time. They built this along with Novartis. And out of this came one of the first of the cell therapies approved uh, by the FDA. And if you look at it, uh, it looks, it, it's certainly GMP. Uh, this is not an academic lab. Uh, look at the 5S, look at uh, how clean everything is. Look at the evenness of how the equipment is placed. Uh, look at the uh, floor and how clean that is. Uh, that is, uh, you can't see it, but the air is filtered. So it's certainly GMP, but it is not the gigantic scale of monoclonal antibody production. That is, it still looks like a laboratory. It, it still is in that scale. And that is one of the differences between this that we'll talk about later in this session uh, between this and what we're calling traditional biomanufacturing. The scale is smaller, the scale is closer to a laboratory scale and therefore benefiting us, the scale is easier for us to replicate. Next slide, please. And this is what a gene therapy treatment looks like. So it is bottled and uh, your students may be surprised, but remember when you talk about uh, viruses, you can get into really big numbers really, really quickly. These are measured by how many viral genomes there are per milliliter, and the viral genomes are uh, typically uh, quantitated by digital drop PCR or some sort of uh, qPCR. And uh, again, this says that there are five times 10 to the 12th viral genomes per ml. Uh, often a treatment will be the injection of 10 to the 15th viruses, 10 to the 15th viral genomes into a patient. That is, these are really, really large numbers. But uh, what I wanted to point out here is at the end of the day, the, the therapy comes in a vial just like other therapies do. Uh, that is, this is what it looks like at the end of the day. Uh, and notice uh, store at minus 65 degrees C. Uh, we are used to that uh, with our current uh, coronavirus challenge. Next slide, please. So if you, how do you produce a human virus, an adenal associated virus in an insect cell? Well, you typically have three different agents. You separate the three different agents and you can either get those nucleic acids 
into the insect cell by infecting it with three different baculoviruses or by transfecting it with three different plasmids. A Y3, well, you don't put all of the genes on one plasmid. You're afraid of those being packaged in a viral particle and then that viral particle being competent to do some replication. Now, uh, uh, having adeno-associated virus helps out. This is a virus that cannot replicate on its own. It cannot replicate without a co-infection in the cell uh, by either adenovirus or a member of the herpes virus families. That is, it does not have all of the genes that it takes to replicate itself. And therefore, it doesn't cause disease in humans. It, uh, it causes a co-infection. It basically was discovered uh, as a impurity in adenovirus preparations. And it was discovered as a virus that is dependent upon a co-infection with another virus. Well, uh, that makes it a good therapy, therapeutic agent. It infects cells and it pushes nucleic acid into the cells, but without the ability to replicate. Now we cripple it either, even further. Uh, you take out the guts of the virus, that is most of the genome and put your transgene in there. And here you have the packaging of the transgene and then a rep is the replication machinery, and then CAP is the capsid proteins. There are three capsid proteins uh, that are all in the same region, and differential processing gives you three different capsid proteins. But you put all three of those, and an insect cell can produce a virus that can infect human cells. Now, if, if you have an alternate approach where you get a producer cell line and uh, you put the required genes in the producer cell line, then you can just add one virus or one plasmid, you, and it makes it easier. So those are two alternate approaches. Next slide, please. So here is uh, adeno-associated virus uh, production uh, using HEC 293 cells. And again, these are very common as well. Uh, you can produce them in HEC-293 that are adherent, or you can adapt HEC-293 to suspension culture and then uh, grow, grow the cells up, uh, transfect them. Again, three different plasmids and ISO will tell you at the end how to do that. And then uh, what you will do is break the cells open because there are a lot of viruses that are internal to the cell. You do that with uh, the detergent tween, although tween is being phased out because it is a estrogen uh, disruptor. And then that spews a lot of DNA into the environment. You add benzenase, which is a deoxyribonuclease to digest the DNA. And then you take that uh, through uh, here. This uses Triton X, so Triton X is a different detergent. You, you, then you take that through uh, chromatography steps, multiple chromatography steps that are designed to purify uh, your adeno virus. Next slide, please. So uh, switching to cell therapies, and again, what's on the market now is CAR-T, and this is basically a cure for cancer. Physicians don't like to use the C word, cure, uh, but that is what this is. So. Uh, in autologous CAR-T, you take the cells out of the patient and you manipulate them, you isolate the T cells, you activate the T cells, you genetically engineer the T cells to display the chimeric antigen receptor, you expand them up in a bioreactor, you freeze them down and put them back into the same patient. Those bed better go back in the same patient. So your a chain of custody and your chain of identity uh, had better be really robust and the FDA is going to require you to uh, assure that these cells coming out of this patient will go back in the same patient. Of course, if you put it into a different patient, then the, the, the immune cells um, are, are going to be reacted by that patient's immune system and there is a risk for graft versus host disease as well. And so chain of identity, chain of custody.
Next slide, please. Uh, on the other hand, uh, so, so here is the, the details of what I just said. And uh, there are some separation techniques to grab T cells out of a mixture that is enriched, but still has this. Uh, remember buffer and media, everything has to be sterile. You can't sterilize afterwards. And so you, you take the, you, you hope that the medical staff doesn't contaminate your raw materials. That is the cells from the patient up front. Uh, leukophoresis, they, this is removing blood from the patient, pulling out the white blood cells and putting the red blood cells and the plasma back in. You preserve the cells, you select for T cells by usually magnetic beads attached to antibodies against CD4, CD8. Uh, you activate it uh, using magnetic beads. You transduce, again, most commonly with lentivirus, expand it, and this is where the majority of the time uh, takes. Uh, this whole, uh, the whole sequence will take two weeks. Uh, that, remember, you're on the clock. The patient often is riddled with cancer and only has a month to live, and so you are fighting the clock on this, but you can't rush the cells in the expansion. You harvest the cells, preserve them, uh, you're doing analytics along the way. You mail them back to the patient and you continue to do analytics and then it's injected into the patient. Next slide, please. And that's allogeneic. Um, sorry, that, that's a, a tologous. Uh, so vein to vein, you take it out of the vein, put it back into the vein. Uh, this is not a frontline treatment. All of the patients that are currently receive this have failed chemotherapy. Uh, the chemotherapy knocked down their typically leukemia and it came roaring back. And uh, uh, now uh, this is their last chance. Uh, the raw materials are variable. You're taking cells out of the patient. Those are the raw materials. And the patient is really sick and they have undergone chemotherapy, which beat up their cells. Uh, sometimes their cells just aren't viable enough to pursue this therapy and they're kind of out of luck. Cold chain considerations, chain of custody, chain of identity are primary importance. Time is of the essence, you're on the clock, the patient can't wait, the patient is near death and you can't make a mistake, there is no room for error. This takes nerves of steel. If you make a mistake, if you contaminate this, you often can't go back to the patient and get another sample you have one shot at this very, very often uh, because the patients are just so sick. Next slide. Uh, here's allogeneic CAR-T, and I took this from one of our local companies, Allogene, and it shows the difference. It, here, it, the hope is to reduce the cost, and the hope is to take away this time constraint, to take, to take it off the, uh, off the clock. So allogeneic, you, if you look down below, you take it from a healthy donor and you isolate their T cells and you expand their T cells. And then you're going to, again, use lentivirus to transduce them uh, with the gene that will allow them to express the chimeric antigen receptor. And now you have a CAR T cell. And then what they do is they ablate a few genes. They take that T cell and get rid of the gene or, or they using zinc fingered nucleases. And I think that rather than CRISPR because that is what they were working on for a long time and what they have the patents for, but using zinc finger nucleases, you get rid of that cell's own T cell receptor and you get rid of their uh, cell surface receptor CD52, which will enable you to suppress the immune response of the patient that receives this uh, to this particular cell. You expand them, purify them, freeze them, and now you can develop a stock. You don't have to do this on, uh, on the clock. You develop a stock and you can take one sample and uh, give that to a patient. And so time to treatment on demand uh, rather than making it for an individual patient uh, on the clock with a major time constraint. And so that is the alternative approach. It uses many of the same 
transduction methods, many of the same expansion methods. Again, it is all single use. Uh, next slide, please. And let me uh, hand it off to Russ Reed. <laughs> 